Dominic Goldrick, welcome to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a real honor, Rosem. Thank you. Yeah, it's thank you for everyone. taking the time uh, really early in the morning in Australia. Um, you shared with us two articles that you wrote, and some of us have read them. And I want to start by asking you a personal question that you wrote, mm. something you wrote in one of the articles, why did it take you three years from the completion of the basic EMDR therapy uh, training to actually using EMDR in your practice? Great question. Great question. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really the reason why you wrote your book as well, because so many of us who do the basic training end up going, ah, this is too scary. I can't do it. So that was the that was the first one. I, I don't think I was so much scared. I think it was more. Um, I haven't got a simple single incident trauma to work with because all the people I was working with, I was working in a treatment center at the time, so everybody had complex presentations. They had a lot of attachment trauma, so it was like, ah, oh, there isn't one simple incident I can focus on and I was just kind of really confused because remember when you've only done part one you haven't even learned interweaves so there's no kind of sense of any kind of flexibility on what you do you just have to kind of go with that go with that and the whole concept of trying to find just one target in somebody's complicated life was just so difficult and then a chap walked in he said oh I want to work on being abused at my first day of school in a Catholic convent by a nun. It was like, oh, what a brilliant, what a brilliant target that is. And I can still remember it to this day that it was sort of like these evil, this towering black figure. That was it. I was like, wow, that's a fantastic image. But it was then trying to tease out the negative cognition and the positive cognition do you know, I spent two sessions trying to get the positive cognition in the same domain as the negative cognition. I mean, I feel such shame, the pain I put the man through. And it's lots of the things I feel are kind of overcome by using an IFS informed approach because he started to go into worried parts going, I'm doing EMDR wrong. And it, it kind of really broke the relationship and I went into a bit of a panic that I went into my worried parts because I'd been in my perfectionist parts in trying to get the, the positive cognition to match the domain of the negative cognition. Um, and thankfully, you know, my wise self went and found a brilliant supervisor who actually is my supervisor today, which is wonderful. And he too is IFS informed. Um, so we started, he he guided me in using what Mark would call an attachment informed, because I know you had Mark Brain on um, a couple of weeks ago, who's a dear colleague and close friend of mine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I started to use that approach, but I started to think I was doing something naughty. I started to think I was breaking the EMDR rules and I'd get expelled for not using the standard protocol properly. So I kind of kept my head down for a long time. Um, so, yeah, so I have a lot of concerns about how EMDR is taught and how inflexible it feels it is when you're initially taught it, even though it actually isn't when you join the community and learn all the other brilliant other approaches that are being integrated with it. Right. You know, the way I think about it is that um, you can't really deviate from the protocol. That's what they teach you in basic training. But then every advanced training that you're taking EMDR is basically changing the basic protocol and adapting it. And I think another way to look at that, you know, instead of taking so many advanced trainings is um, just see what your clients need just assess in the moment uh, what the client needs and, and adapt based on your client needs, not the protocol is not what's important. Your client is important. Your, the protocol is a tool to help your client. But what you name in there, Rotem, is being relational. 
And being relational isn't something you're taught in the basic training. That's why I base my articles on a response <clears throat> to the Council of Scholars, because I felt so excited that they were actually naming EMDR is a relational integrative psychotherapy because it kind of gave me permission to come out of the naughty step and go, mm -hmm. oh, that's how I've been doing it. I'm doing it in a relational way. I'm following my client and adapting it according to where my client is and what they need. But I'm really aware of where I am in the eight phases and, and where I want to get to. So that's really important. And, you know, I think that's what's great that people like Mark Dworkin have put on the map um, in his 2005 book, Relational EMDR. Yeah. And he says there that he believes Francine saw it as relational, but that was more implicit than explicit. But I, I would argue it's one of the reasons why so many people end up not using EMDR. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you look at, um, you may know of research by, sorry, <clears throat> you need to talk for a second, Rotem, while I just clear my throat. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, curious of what you're about to say, and I want to talk more about the IFS-informed EMDR and how it helps to reduce that fear. Because again, we're going back, I think in consultations, we spend so much time just reducing fear, just telling people it's not you know, most of the things that you're going to do are not going to harm your clients. So, uh, so I'm, I'm curious about, you know, IFS and how it helps the IFS informed approach helps to reduce that fear. Yeah. So before I got a frog in my throat, I was just about, I'll come on to that in a second. I was just about to say research in the UK from Derek Farrell said that only 10 to 12% of those who train in EMDR go on to become practitioners. So of a study of 10 four, to 12%. And that is, when is this research from? That is really interesting. And I would like the reference. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you the reference. I was reading it on the weekend. Yeah, no, it's kind of fall off your chair moment, isn't it? It's yeah. like, it's so shocking. Not, uh, not a big surprise. And I mean, that, this is that's this why is you exactly wrote your why book. I wrote this book because yeah. I think it's such a great approach, and so many people give up because they feel that it's inflexible. Absolutely. And one one of my supervisees, she said, "Oh my goodness," she said, "It felt like they were sending me into a war zone. It was, you know, it's so dangerous, and use it, and don't use it, and use it." And she said, "I was then completely terrified." But the other thing I find concerning is that they then say. Well, if you do this right, so it's kind of encouraging those perfectionist parts that I was describing with my first client, then it'll work. Well, it doesn't because that's giving you an external instruction that's not relational. So what I love about IFS is it brings a relational dynamic into the work. It's saying, let's get curious about what parts of our client are getting triggered here, what parts of our client are freezing or going numb or want to or dissociating or don't want to go to that memory. So yeah. it's that concept. So I think there's a couple of things that for me, well, we can go more into the similarities and differences, but it, it's kind of it's instantly giving a relationship both with the client and with the client's parts. It's the concept of multiplicity that different parts are doing different jobs. And what if the client in a healthy way is actually just trying to protect themselves and exploring that, or maybe that's a part that's stuck in an old pattern that was there from being a child. And maybe now they're an adult, it is safer for them to, to talk about that memory, but it wasn't safe when they were a child. So it just gives us much more information to go on. One of one of the people who did my course, she said, oh, she said, I get it. She said, it's a little bit like we're doing EMDR. We're entering a darkened room and we don't know who's in the room. If we've got IFS and we know whether we've got protectors, 
whether they're managers or firefighters or exiles, there's like we're turning the lights on and we know who's there. We know who's inside. So that's why I think it just gives all of us, the client, us, the therapist, much more information about what's going on inside and not this kind of really kind of just focus, focus, focus on what the target is. I mean, that's the other argument that IFS world make is that EMDR just goes far too directly and quickly bypassing the protectors and really freaks the system out. Um, and that's what can generate some of those amber reactions. Because from a basic point of view, I, EMDR doesn't even ask permission. So it's a little bit like if I was coming around your house to see your kids, Rotem, and I was a bit concerned about them, it's like I'd knock on the door. I wouldn't even ask your permission. I'd just march in and go and start talking to your kids. You wouldn't feel very happy about that, would you? Probably not. <laughs> So at the most basic, at least ask permission. Yeah. Um, can we talk about phase two? Because in IFS, in, in one of the articles that you shared with us, that you wrote, you say that there's no, there's no grounding, there's no resourcing. So how does that integrate into the um, eight phase model, especially with you know, attention to phase two? Well, the first thing is I'm I'm not doing a rigid approach to IFS. So I actually profoundly disagree with the IFS overall approach with that. And what I do like about what Dick Schwartz says is, you know, you can be flexible with my protocol. What I ask of you, if you're going to use IFS, is that you treat the parts as sacred inner beings. Mm. So it's that kind of deep level of respect. So there are several people within the IFS world who are saying, actually, actually to just dismiss grounding and preparation, that actually doesn't work with people who are very dissociated, very traumatized. So that's where I do stay with EMDR. So, so I see myself as IFS informed, but primarily an EMDR therapist. So I'm kind of bringing IFS in wherever it's helpful. I'm not, so it's not like my whole map is IFS and I'm bringing EMDR in. It's it's the other way around. My overall approach is EMDR because I do think EMDR is quicker and more direct if we can do that. But if we can't, then, then using IFS to dialogue with the parts, get permission, and understand their role and their purpose and help them upgrade their jobs. I mean, what I really love about IFS is the concept of a system that we're going, that there's a whole system here that's, you know, about homeostasis and about thriving. And if we go directly in and begin to change a part, well, that's going to affect the whole system. I mean, I used to work as a family therapist in a treatment center and used to say that the family is like a, a child's mobile hanging over the cot. And when the wind blows, the whole lot moves. So we're changing things in a system that's going to affect all of it, isn't it? And so that sometimes is why there can be ab reactions and backlash, because we haven't appreciated the whole system and how it works and, and the intricacies of the different, the different roles different parts play. So I think that's really important. So, yeah, no, I, I, I totally disagree with that aspect of IFS and think it's really, really important. Um, but I do like what I know you've had Jamie Marich on as well, who I think is absolutely brilliant. And I like and I think you say this in the book that, you know, we do some preparation and some grounding in those skills and get into desensitization. And then the client can go back and do a bit more resourcing. It's like there's a bit more space there right. to allow a bit more self-care. So it's like a bit of a TikTok in those kinds of things. So I like I like to kind of see it in that whole way. The more we desensitize, um, the more space there is. And that's why I like the language of IFS, because it talks about the, the parts carrying burdens. 
And so the more the parts are unburdened, the freer they are to kind of collaborate, cooperate, and the whole system to kind of take better care of the client. Yeah, I like the systems thinking, first of all, uh, you know, it's, we, I think in the modern world, we, we're looking for quick solutions. So if you resolve this, then the problem is gone. But then a lot of times in, with, with systems thinking, you look at, all right, if this is changed, I'm, you know, mm. one example I'm thinking about is SSRI medications for depression. You're changing the dopamine. Let's say you are changing the dopamine level. What happens to the other parts of the brain? What happens to the other neurochemicals in the brain. So same thing with, with our internal system, you're changing one parts. And that's why we're seeing sometimes we feel like we're making progress. And then, you know, the next session, something is happening. So Annabelle, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the parts, the different parts in IFS, their roles, and how it integrates into our EMDR work. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there is, I could have brought a PowerPoint, but I haven't, but you can find it very easily. I, I, I'm doing that because it's it's a mandala, it's a circle. And the idea that there are kind of three main groups of parts, the managers, the firefighters, and the exiles. And then in the center is what's called self-energy. And what I love about EMDR, EMDR, I love EMDR, of course I do. And what I love about IFS is it says that um, our self-energy is never damaged by trauma. It's the parts who take the hit. And this, this is the bit that I think EMDR and IFS share is this sense that the healing energy is within the client. So in IFS, it's called self-energy. In EMDR, it's called adaptive information processing. Now, one of my things with EMDR is that its language is a bit clunky, whereas I think the language of IFS is much more kind of relational and fun. And what if, what if self-energy, I mean, I know we talked about this briefly earlier, self-energy has theoretically eight Cs. I am just going to check I've got them right. Calmness, curiosity, compassion, connectedness, confidence, creativity, courage, clarity. I mean, I said that to one client. He said, oh, great. Is there a pill for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, what I like about it is it kind of puts a bit more flesh on the bones of what health and well-being looks like. I don't think EMDR gives us enough of that. So what IFS brings to me is a kind of holistic model of the mind with uh, the concept of the different parts. Um, but this idea that self-energy is never damaged, I think that's much less pathologizing than other models like structural dissociation can be. It's much more optimistic. It's much more spiritual. I mean, I was initially trained as a transpersonal therapist, so this makes a lot of sense to me that this is the self-energy is like your soul, your essence, your beingness, and it's never damaged by trauma. So that's much more hopeful for clients who've had a lot of early childhood trauma. It says you don't have to have had all that nurture. This essence is, is within you, but the parts the managers, the firefighters, the exiles, they're burdened and they're like the clouds that cover the sunshine of your self-energy. So first of all, it's that optimism. Um, so what, what Dick Schwartz discovered is that what to me makes his model a little bit different from others is this idea that, yes, the parts are like the clouds, but if you invite them to relax back, invite them to sit back. Oh, then there's more space for that self-energy. So we don't like the Dalai Lama have to sit and meditate for four hours a day to access this. Um, it is actually already within us. I do also feel that the more desensitization we do, then the more space there is for self-energy. So I think there are there is a lot of kind of read across in both models about that. 
Now, I've got lost in self-energy because I think that's that's so healing and helpful. Um, but just to go back to the parts. So basically, although there are three groups of parts, they actually do two different jobs. So both the managers and the firefighters, they're both protectors. They're trying to protect the exiles. The exiles are the ones who hold the worthlessness, the shame, the loneliness, the real pain. And it's often the exile, well, it's usually the exiles where we're trying to access in EMDR. And the trouble is, that's what I was saying earlier about going too fast, that, you know, in EMDR, we kind of go, oh, I got to that really, really distressed little child. But just like the analogy of marching into your house and finding your children, We've just marched past the protectors, the managers and the firefighters, and they can get really pissed off about it that yeah. you've gone there too fast. Right. So the the differentiation between the managers and the firefighters is basically the managers are proactive. They're trying to go, oh, well, if I'm really successful and do my job brilliantly, then those pesky little shameful exiles won't get out. So the managers are often kind of controlling and perfectionist and judging and striving and hardworking. But that doesn't always work, does it? Our little exiles still get triggered as well. So that's where the firefighters come along. And that term firefighter, I think it kind of describes it well. They're very reactive. So they're kind of getting their fire hoses out and kind of, intensely trying to shut up the little kids who well, are I heard um, on one course the metaphor it's a little bit like the exiles are like little kids at a disco and the firefighters are like the bouncers on the door well the managers are like the bouncers and then there's some really heavy ones who come in and kind of turn the fire hose on the kids when they get too excited mm. so you know, the firefighters, well, in EMDR, we meet them as dissociation, as distraction. We meet them as fantasy clients who have all kinds of um, addictions, eating disorders, those kind of things. So it's like, shut out the pain, shut up the kids. So I think making these differentiations between parts can really help us as an EMDR therapist, that's what I was, that's that quote you gave earlier about giving us a map can be really helpful on understanding the kids inside, basically. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that we had from one of our community members was how do you go back and forth between IFS and EMDR and then IFS again? And the way I understand it, the way that you teach it, and I want you to also uh, if you don't mind talking about your course that you're teaching the the really um, deep dive into that, it's not like a, you know, like a, a few hours, of course, you're doing it over an, extend, an extended period of time. But my understanding that the two models really integrate. So it's not like you're doing either this or this, but you're actually doing both at the same time. Mm, that's right. Well, I mean, how to integrate them is still kind of, I think I'll I'll take that to my grave kind of thing. It's like always scratching my head on how to do it. I do think a big part is what you said a moment ago. It's it's what does this client need? How can I connect with this client? And so I kind of think of it more like a continuum that some sessions are more EMDR-y and some sessions are more IFS-y. And we're kind of sliding along that continuum depending on where that particular client is at this point in their recovery and achieving the particular goals they want to achieve. So I, I, I kind of alter it in that way. I mean, I have written a protocol myself where kind of through the eight phases, I kind of track through what it could look like in an ideal world. And one of the things to start with that we haven't talked about yet is understanding therapist parts, kind of checking in with my own therapist parts in the beginning. And then I do like to use Laura Parnell's approach with resourcing. 
I think resourcing is really helpful because that's, again, a criticism I have of IFS is not all clients are able to access self-energy. Mm. But if we have those external resource figures, the nurturers, protectors and wise beings, they're just external kind of prompts, if you like, for those internal feelings of self-energy. So I do like to use those. And then kind of I prefer to use Laurel's simplified model of kind of finding a trigger in the present and then using that to kind of find a part. But actually a part is just a target. Whenever, when it, So it's kind of TikTok in between it being a target. Bruce Hersey talks about this really nicely, kind of using parts language in finding a target so well you talk about it too and and, and I'm yeah. quoting one of your articles you say in ifs the memory is seen as a story to be shared by the parts who experience the, that trauma the self witnesses the story along with the therapist with compassion and curiosity and it is the self that steps into the scene so the exile is no longer alone and that's yeah. kind of, I think that's the, the that beautiful integration, right? Like this is like when self is witnessing, and again, sometimes we need the therapist, you know, to be, to express more presence. That's the relational mm -hmm. approach. Uh, this is the path to adaptive resolution. Mm -hmm. Well, again, if we kind of look at those from an EMDR and an IFS point of view, um, EMDR has this great concept of dual awareness. So it's kind of one foot in the present, one foot in the past. Right. And we are trying to get the client with more kind of today eyes look at that scene in the past. But what if, what if the, the client's healthiest adult self, well, uh, sorry, adult in self energy with that compassion and curiosity could actually visualize stepping into that scene and then kind of approach the little one. And if we were working with the little two-year-old part of you, say, Rotem, step into that scene with that two-year-old part of you. There's dad there shouting at you. Just let that little one know that you're there because he know you're there. And quite often when you ask child parts, they say, I don't know who he is. Well, let him know, give him an update. Tell him who you are. Tell him what your life is, who you're married to, your job and how many people. So that's kind of calm in the system and putting a resource right in the scene. And then because this is all IFS, does this I mean, other therapies do this as well. Um, what does this little one want? Does he want you to hold his hand? Does he want you to does he want to sit on your lap and then let him. And so you can kind of you can do all of this with BLS and then you can kind of feel the imagery of the shouting father beginning to blur and disappear. Now, with a few people I've done this with, I mean, a colleague I did it with in, in a demo once, she'd worked on a particular very dramatic target multiple times um, in, involving a, a father and a gun. Her father was a policeman, a very dramatic. Um, but she froze and dissociated every time. But when her adult self stepped into the scene, and when her adult self connected with the little one and they started having eye contact, they even started to do BLS together. So the little one was able to look at my colleague, my colleague Claire, and they were both kind of able to do this. And she kept kind of tick-tocking, looking through the child's eyes at the adult and the adult's eyes at the child. Then what was fascinating was she felt the feeling she'd never felt before because it enabled her body to have enough self-presence to be able to process that memory fully. So that's, that's what I, th so we're all trying to find more effective tools with EMDR to actually drop right into the feelings, to be able to process and metabolize them. Excellent. Um, okay. Annabelle, before, we finish that section and we move into a, a q a and a little demo um can you say a few words about your upcoming training 
Yeah, sure. So um, I, like you, think EMDR basic training is is so ridiculously short um, that it just doesn't equip people to work with all the complex presentations. So I've gone the other extreme and made mine 16 weeks, but it's three hours a week. And it's to do what you rightly talk about in your book, some of that deliberate practice kind of using the science of learning. Um, So we meet for three hours a week and we're kind of TikTok in between theory, because like you say, it doesn't matter how many books you've read and how many courses you've been on, if you haven't actually practiced it. (laughs) Um, So we do lots of practice. And um, like I said, I've written this one protocol that kind of integrates the whole thing, kind of finding a target, accessing self-energy, getting permission, adult stepping into the scene but there's lots of different steps here there's lots of new bits to learn about the different roles of the parts actually finding a part focusing on a part and then we haven't even got to when parts begin to polarize and you've got conflicts between parts so that's particularly what's happening when we've got addictions you've got a manager having a fight with a firefighter so you've got a critical manager saying you're a bloody arsehole why are you always drinking and the drinking part's going well you can f off um i've got to, i've got to do that to shut up the wounded child who keeps screaming and if i don't keep drinking you won't be able to function so exploring po- polarities so yeah so there's there's quite a combination between theory and and practice but we're, we're trying to make sure there's a, as much practice as possible. You know what I find interesting, Rotem, is how many people get scared of the practice and they kind of go, oh, I can't turn up this week for practice. I'm busy. I've got to do this. And I make up. They've got some worried parts. But then when they come to write their feedback, they say the course was brilliant, could have done with more practice. So I just find that interesting. <laughs> How many people realize that at the end? So another big part of the course, one of my one of my team members said, um, she said, oh, this course is great. She said, you actually get two for the price of one. You're learning lots of theory to use with your clients, but also you're learning about your own therapist parts. And so that's really integral to the course. What part am I in? What's the the U-turn that's occurring inside of me in understanding my parts? So I'm not sure if we've got time to to do it today, but I have a little meditation I like to do in exploring your own parts that get triggered by clients. I think, again, that's a really central piece of IFS is all the time. I mean, in other therapies, it's called transference and countertransference. Um, but again, wow, that language is clunky. What about we talk about what parts of Rotem are getting triggered? Is it your worried parts, your perfectionist parts, your caretaking parts, your trauma parts? So really understanding yourself and what's getting activated by particular clients is really important. So that's what I'm encouraging the participants to work on all the time, understanding themselves and using triggers with clients as particular targets to work on in in the practice sessions. So in the last one we finished um, in June, so we went from February to June, and several of them said, oh, I want it to be longer. You've got to do a part two. So in some ways, we're only scratching the surface. I mean, if you look at IFS, I'm doing 48 hours, and IFS part one is 100 hours. So IFS is saying, we want to help you with your therapist parts, understand them and work with them, know when they're getting triggered by your clients much more. And again, I think this is um, a missing piece in the training of EMDR that, yes, it comes later, but I think we really do do our trainees a disservice to not kind of front load it a bit more so. That's a big part of my training. And you did have a question. I'm in Australia. Yes, we do a course, Australian mornings that Americans can join. And we also have a UK course. 
that's Australian afternoon. So three hours a week, we get to, we get to make some good friends. Yes. So for those of us who are with us live, I dropped the link in the chat. And for those who watch it later on YouTube or the Art and Science of VMDR website, there will be links below this video for Annabelle's trading. Um, Annabelle McGoldrick, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I've only just begun. <laughs> I know. We should do a, a part two. Mm -hmm.